So topic three, we were talking about um, light microscopy and electron microscopy. And today I want to talk about uh, one more type of microscopy and a few other uh, kind of uh, cell biology lab techniques. So let's get into that. So a type of uh, microscopy that I want to talk about is called scanning probe microscopy. Uh, so this is relatively new. Uh, it's been around since I think about the 1980s. Um, but uh, this is the kind of thing that for, I think until about 10 or 12 years ago, if you wanted one, you had to build it yourself. Uh, you can actually buy some of these nowadays, but uh, up until uh, then, uh, like even 20 years ago, if you wanted one, you had to construct the entire thing yourself. So these probe microscopies, uh, systems, uh, there's a whole bunch of different names for them. There's atomic force, there's scanning probe, uh, tunneling microscopy. They have, have different names, but they're all called basically probe microscopy. You can kind of think of it as like a blind person. Uh, so rather than having a light source that is illuminating something, uh, it's kind of like a, a blind person might come up and, uh, you know, they'll, they'll feel what's in front of them. It's a, it's a dog or a tree or a yeah, you know, whatever it is that they're touching with their, with their fingers. So if you take a look at this, um, this diagram here on the left, what you have is a probe. So the probe is like a finger or something like that. And, and what it's doing is it's going along the surface sort of back and forth and uh, dragging along the surface. And uh, in some cases, depending on the exact type of this probe microscopy, it's actually touching what's there. So it's kind of feeling what's there. And it goes back and forth. And then uh, in a computer, it's going to make a three-dimensional image on this. So you can see there's one there on the right. Um, I've never used one myself, but I have a brother-in-law that, uh, that has, and um, so maybe I should ask him a bit more about it sometime. So the cool thing about this type of microscopy is uh, you can actually see individual atoms. So if you take a look, this is a type called scanning tunneling microscopy. And what you're looking at here on the left is uh, those little uh, round things each of those are actually gold atoms. So this is really amazing. You can see that small. The one on the, on the right is silicon. Silicon is, uh, um, of course, another type of uh, element. And you can see the, uh, the atoms are, are being visualized there. So uh, something else that's really cool with this type of microscopy is uh, there are ways, and I'm not exactly sure how this works, but you can actually pick up atoms and you can move them and you can construct things using this type of microscopy using the probe. So if you take a look there, that's actually a corporate logo by IBM. Maybe you can see the IBM in there, I and B and M. So see IBM. And uh, so they thought they were pretty cool when they did that. And uh, anyway, this is really, really fascinating type of technology. Uh, IBM a couple of years ago, uh, so this is 2013, they upped their game and they made a little video. I will play that for you right now. And here goes. This was basically stop motion animation uh, using individual atoms. So really, really cool thing they've done here. So I'll stop it there. But uh, anyway, I thought uh, you might enjoy that video. It's pretty cool. Uh, so uh, there's another type called atomic force microscopy, which is another type of probe microscopy. 
Uh, the tunneling microscopy, um, it actually uh, tunnels and moves electrons. Uh, the force microscopy is more like uh, touching. And this is what can be used on some biological specimens. I found this one on the internet. Apparently, this is the world's fastest atomic force micro microscope. So uh, go figure. Um, I don't know how much it costs, uh, but I think they are um, probably uh, fifty to hundred thousand dollars would be my guess for these kind of things. Um, so uh, looking at different atoms, you can see uh, uh, there's somebody who looked at um, this particular chemical structure, and you can you can sort of make it out. Uh, the problem is when you get to biological specimens. Uh, they're a lot more squishy than, say, a gold or silicon surface. And so you can imagine, again, going back to that blind man. If a blind man feels a tree, it's really obvious. But what if a blind man, you know, is touching a, a jello mold or something like that? Uh, it's going to be squishier and it's going to be a little bit harder to tell what it is. So uh, you can't quite get down to the atom level uh, with biological specimens, but there have been people that are doing some cool things. I'll show you some images. So there is somebody who is looked at on the left, uh, some urethrocytes. So those are red blood cells and you can make up the disc shape on them. And uh, somebody has a, a platelet that's starting to clot on the right there. So um, maybe not as amazing as some of the, the uh, electron microscopy, but uh, we're getting there and some people are doing some interesting things. Uh, there's somebody on the left who is looking at uh, a virus. So you can see really, really small things, much better than light mic microscopy. Uh, if you take a look at this uh, herpes simplex uh, virus here, uh, you can actually see the individual capsid proteins. So right there, and you can see they're arranged in kind of a hexagon. So I think that's really, really cool. There's E. coli on the right. You can see these little uh, strand-like things. Those are the flagella. and uh, uh, although you can see the E. coli is, is just a little bit warped. So again, like I said, that's, that's the thing, right? Uh, the specimens sometimes get a little warped with this type of microscopy. And uh, although the techniques are getting better, uh, there's some human chromosomes, some cancer tissue. Uh, you can see uh, color is being added uh, in order to kind of enhance what you're looking at. And uh, there's E. coli again. I'm not sure if these kind of divots here are uh, artifacts. Uh, sometimes you get artifacts when you're doing these, these type of techniques where you're, like I said, kind of, um, you know, you're, you're being rough on your, on your subject here. And uh, I thought this one was really cool where somebody was looking at uh, DNA. Uh, so that on the left is the, the computer generated image. And on the right, you can see, uh, you can definitely see there's a helix. Can't necessarily make out every atom, and you can see because of the sort of the dragging back and forth, there's a lot of lines through it. Uh, but you can make out some details. So really, really cool stuff. There'll probably be a lot more we're going to see on this uh, in the future as people get better at it and as we develop new techniques. Okay, so um, I wanted to kind of get everyone starting to think about midterms. Uh, the midterm is early February, and um, uh, sometime in the next week, I'm going to be posting a sample midterm on Moodle uh, once I get around to it. But I thought I would introduce some of the types of questions. So you're going to have on your midterm, you're going to have questions that are multiple choice, true and false. Uh, I usually have uh, um, some matching questions in there. And uh, I'll have some short answer and long answer questions. So short answer are usually worth one mark. And short answer could be anywhere from being like a definition to find something. Uh, uh, to, uh, you know, describe something, you know, let's say describe what is going on in prophase or something like that of, of mitosis. Uh, the long answer questions are all going to be worth five marks. And uh, here's a sample one that, uh, that I've given in the past, and I give this one quite frequently. And you can see it's, uh, I think I mentioned it last day, it says compare and contrast the light microscope with the electron microscope. Um, and actually we're contrasting three types of microscopy, SEM and TEM, uh, the two types of electron microscope, and, uh, and give examples, right? So this is a five mark question, and if you want to answer this well, you should have at least five points, okay? Uh, make sure you have at least five points, because sometimes if you're just giving kind of five small points, I might just give you half a mark for that, and then and you're not gonna get five or five on the question. So things to compare, uh, things that we've been talking about, uh, you know, what the light sources are, what the lenses are made of, uh, what the magnification is like. Um, you know, there's other details, some of the different techniques. We've got fluorescence and oil immersion, uh, you know, those kind of things. And, and examples, you know, give me good concrete examples of something that you're going to see under that type of microscope. So um, 
for example, the transmission electron microscope, you can see inside cells. So talk about seeing organelles and so on. So I'll be showing you a few more of these uh, kind of as we get closer to the midterm. We're not there yet. We're kind of uh, uh, somewhere around the halfway mark in terms of um, the material we've covered to get to the midterm, but we are getting there soon. And like I said, I will try to make sure I have a sample midterm up uh, soon. Uh, so somebody is asking a question. And, um, okay, the question says, I'm wondering why on Moodle it says I can no longer access the hand in sheets for labs one and two. Um, good question. I will look into that. It's possibly uh, I was playing around with the settings and I may have uh, messed around with that. But uh, the lab one and two is not due till next week, so I have lots of time to fix that. Thanks for pointing that out. Sorry, I was just going to ask about like the sample midterm. Will you include like um, an answer key as well with the sample midterm, or just like, um, I think what I have is a partial answer scheme, uh, if I remember correctly. I'll I'll, I'll take a look at it. Um, it's a, it's the same sample midterm I give every I, I put up every year, so maybe I'll take a look at it and edit it a little bit better. Um, the format, the online format, is um, always a little bit different and uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, I usually design the uh, online tests a little bit differently because of, uh, for various reasons. So anyway, thanks for the question. So look, look forward to that. And like I said, I'll try to make sure I have that up in the next couple of days once I get some time to look at it. Okay, so um, what about other things we do in the lab? There's lots of things obviously you can do in the lab for looking at cells. And one of the most important things is obviously having the cells um, to grow. And so you can see my point, it says here, why grow cells in the lab? Well, obviously we want to grow them to study them um, and, and do experiments. But uh, actually in, in, um, in many careers and, and, and businesses uh, and, and areas of, of the world, uh, we're growing cells all the time. And uh, a big one is, of course, uh, to diagnose diseases. So sometimes you get a swab. And uh, for example, I had strep throat a few years ago, and they put a little swab in my throat, and they put it in a little test tube, and uh, it goes off to a diagnostic lab where they grow it on some, some agar, and then they tell me that I had strep throat and, and gave me a prescription for it. Um, another big uh, reason why we grow cells is to produce vaccines. Uh, so uh, if you think about the, uh, the magnitude of um, like the flu vaccine and, and uh, you know, the government of Canada orders, I think something like 20 or 30 million uh, shots of that. And, and so that's quite a bit of um, cells that need to be grown for that vaccine. Um, and th there's lots of industries that rely on these things, uh, uh, on, on growing different types of cells. And in many cases, we're talking about microbes, so wine making and uh, beer making and, and things like that. So uh, we're thinking about it for science, of course. And uh, so something that cells require are many things, and you can kind of think of them as two categories, physical and chemical. So if you think about the physical categories, usually what we mean by physical, we're talking about temperature and pH and osmotic, pre osmotic pressure, which, is, which really means the amount of salt. And uh, we'll come back to osmotic pressure uh, when we talk about membranes. So that's uh, our, our next topic, topic four. So let's just talk about temperature for a minute. Uh, most organisms, whether they're microorganisms or um, others, uh, you know, we're, we're happiest kind of in this range here. You can see right here. Uh, so you probably know that human body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. And uh, so, you know, if our core body temperature gets a lot hotter, it's, it's actually really bad for us. Uh, you know, we can die from that. And same thing if it gets too cool, that's hypothermia and we can die from that as well. And so most organisms kind of like a, a comfortable range. Um, about about um, 50 degrees Celsius is, uh, you know, death for a lot of organisms. There are some uh, organisms you can see up here, it's talking about, um, it says in this range destroys most microbes. There are some microorganisms, uh, bacteria and archaea in particular that can survive some extreme temperatures. Uh, but for the most part, it's about, about 50 degrees Celsius. So there's optimum, about 37 for most organisms. And then uh, minimum, um, again, it kind of depends on what type of organism uh, you're, you are. Um, 
but uh, usually there's, there's actually very few. There's, there's a couple of microorganisms that can actually grow and survive uh, well at uh, temperatures of lower, lower than zero, but most things, are, of course, are going to be plus zero because that's where water freezes. So here's a word. Um, most organisms are what are called mesophiles, and that means we like kind of moderate, medium temperatures. Uh, organisms that like high temperatures are called thermophiles or hyperthermophiles, and uh, cooler organisms that like cooler temperatures are called uh, psychotrophs or psychrophiles. So just to give you an idea, I'm often thinking about bacteria, of course, and um, here's some optimal growth temperatures of some common uh, bacteria that can cause disease. So we're going to talk a little bit about E. coli uh, this semester, and E. coli is found in your intestine. E. coli is not bad. Sometimes it's bad, but it's not bad in itself. We all have it in our intestine, and notice its optimal temperature is actually 40 degrees, so not quite 37. E. coli is actually found in the intestine of birds as well, and birds actually have higher uh, regular body temperatures, so closer to 40 degrees. Um, we talked about Staphylococcus, and it's happiest at 37. So probably no surprise there because it likes humans. And um, this third one is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. That's another uh, organism that causes human disease. So tuberculosis is a lung infection. And uh, we don't uh, have a lot of cases in Canada anymore, but historically it was a very, very important uh, disease. And the last one I wanted to mention was this one here, Listeria. So you may have heard of Listeria. Uh, its optimal temperature is 30 degrees Celsius, but it's kind of uh, interesting in that it has a really broad range. It doesn't mind cold temperatures. So Listeria, unfortunately, will survive really well in your fridge. And uh, every once in a while with Listeria, we end up with recalls, uh, food recalls. So sometimes it's lunch meat. Um, this product here, I was looking, I just Googled Listeria. Uh, recalls and uh, this product here was under a major recall looks like it was back in 2013 um, a cheesy macaroni salad so this is the kind of thing that can get spread uh, in, uh, fecally contaminated so uh, comes out of animals and uh, can get on uh, sometimes vegetables sometimes lunch meat and and some certain processed foods and uh, sometimes people get really really sick from it uh, it's the kind of organism that uh, most of us, uh, I'm assuming, are reasonably healthy adults. Um, we would, uh, you know, get sick. Um, so we would, you know, have some, maybe some diarrhea and vomiting and, and kind of, you know, we'd be fine after a few days. But if you're, uh, if you're a really old person or you're a baby, it can, it can be fatal, unfortunately. So make sure your food is fresh and uh, we will be okay. It's pretty rare, but it does happen once in a while. Uh, I guess I meant to put this one here first. Um, this was um, the most, uh, one of the most lethal listeria up, uh, outbreaks um, in the last 25 years. And this was uh, 2011, and this was in Colorado, and it was on cantaloupes. So you can see uh, this is a big listeria outbreak, 25 people dying from it. So um, that's, uh, that's actually quite a bit for a food outbreak in, uh, in a country like Canada or the U.S. So there's some more, it looks like I found some more. I was spending a little bit of time on the internet and uh, there's some more recent ones anyway. Most of these uh, food recalls, by the way, um, have uh, uh, geographical locations. So none of these were Alberta recalls. I think one of them was New Brunswick and the other one was, uh, um, was it Quebec or Manitoba? I can't remember now. So that's physical requirements. And uh, uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about pH and osmotic pressure today. But uh, another thing that organisms need and um, cells need if you want to grow them in a lab is they need food. And uh, there's all sorts of different types of things that we can give them. And uh, so you, they usually need carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, uh, phosphorus, and so on. And uh, so let's just talk about some of these here. So let's talk about oxygen because this is going to come up a couple of times in this course. And uh, so oxygen, of course, for you and me is essential. If we don't get oxygen, what's the result? We die. So that's not good. So what does that make us? We are something called obligate aerobes. It's obligate means you're obligated, and aerobic means you need oxygen. So that's what we need. And this is the same with a lot of cell types. And when we start talking about bacteria in a couple of units from now, 
um, we're going to notice that some of them are obligate aerobes. Some of them are obligate anaerobes, meaning that uh, they cannot tolerate oxygen and they will actually die in the presence of oxygen. And then there's some organisms that are kind of somewhere in between. They're called facultative anaerobes. And so what does that mean? It means that they, uh, um, they can survive in both conditions, uh, aerobic or anaerobic. Um, they usually uh, grow faster in the presence of oxygen, but they can do just fine without it. And so E. coli is a good example of something that falls into this category where it likes oxygen, but doesn't always have access to it. So how do we grow these things if they're anaerobic in a the lab? There's um, a number of different techniques. Uh, most people have this cheap technique kind of on the left here, some sort of jar or container. Um, this one here called the gas pack is a um, uh, commercially available one and it's, uh, it's airtight. And, and uh, I'm not exactly sure of the chemistry behind these gas packs, uh, but they absorb, um, uh, there's uh, some chemistry in there that will uh, absorb all the oxygen out of the air. Um, so we have one of these at Keanu College. Uh, another thing that you can do is you can get something called a bell jar. So a bell jar kind of looks like this, like a bell. It has a platform on the bottom. You put your petri dishes in there. There's my petri dishes. And then what you do is you just light a candle. And so you can imagine what the candle is doing. It's consuming all the oxygen. And so that's kind of a cheap old method. Doesn't suck out all the oxygen, but gets most of it and uh, works well for some organisms. You may have seen in some movies, uh, people using these glove boxes. Uh, sometimes they're used for really dangerous samples. Uh, so sometimes movies are looking at some crazy biohazardous material. Uh, but sometimes it's because people are growing things anaerobically. So it's a larger chamber. Usually you can flood the chamber with nitrogen gas or something like that and to, to uh, get out all the oxygen. And you can uh, put larger equipment in there as well for manipulating your samples. So in our lab, most of our organisms are aerobic and we can culture them relatively easily. Um, and we don't need to worry about the anaerobic stuff, but we do have one organism that, that we do grow anaerobically. So what you need to do is you need to give them food. And uh, in, in most cases, what we're doing is giving organisms or cells um, basically an enriched food. And so if you take a look at this here, this is a recipe, I, I like the name of a terrific broth. And so what's in terrific, terrific broth? Is it's got these things here, these bactotryptone and these yeast extracts. So what they do is they take, um, uh, I'm not sure what the bactotryptone is, but the yeast extract is, uh, they basically take some baker's yeast and um, uh, I think they throw uh, a little bit of acid and some chemicals in there. And basically the yeast cells, if you think about yeast cells, yeast cells, uh, they're cells. So they have everything that other cells might need in there. So they, they could be good food. So you kill them, you break them open, and, and whatever's in there gets released. So lipids, nucleotides, uh, you name it. Uh, the bactotryptone is some sort of um, uh, protein source. So it's just extra amino acids. So it's kind of like putting them in a rich soup. And you can see there on the left, we've got some organisms living there uh, in um, some test tubes in these liquid cultures. And that's a pretty common way to grow uh, bacteria in particular. I'll talk about growing animal cells in a few minutes, by the way. So here's a cool thing about bacterial cells. And uh, just gonna show you some cool math here in a moment. Um, but uh, the uh, bacterial cells are super easy to grow and uh, super easy to study because they, they um, replicate very quickly. So they double. And uh, something like E. coli can double every 20 minutes um, under ideal conditions. Uh, real, realistic conditions is usually 30 minutes. So after 30 minutes, you go from one cell to two, then you go from two to four, and then you go from four to eight, 16, 32, 64, and so on. And you can get uh, a lot of cells really quickly and actually do, uh, do this kind of growth overnight. So um, let me show you, this is kind of, like I said, a cool mathematical exercise. If you think hypothetically, how many cells could we get if we had unlimited amount of resources? So you start off with one cell, that's one picogram. So picogram is 10 to the minus, is it minus 12 or minus 15? I can't remember, it's super, super small. So after 30 minutes, you get two cells, that's two picograms. An hour, you get four cells, 0.4 picograms. Two hours, still not a lot. Notice we're doubling every 30 minutes here. So what about 12 hours? So try this on your calculator, right? Think about it. if somebody gave you a penny today, 
and they said they would double it every day for 30 days. Just go two times two times two times two times two, and uh, the numbers go up really fast. So after 12 hours, now you're in the microgram category. So this is still uh, about a millionth of a gram, uh, which does not sound like much, but uh, 16 million cells from one to 16 million. So keep doubling this, and you know this is uh, for another 12 hours. So that's uh, that's uh, 24 doublings, and now you get 168 grams. Um, do this again for 48 hours, 72 hours. Uh, we are getting massive numbers. So theoretically, if you uh, had a culture of E. coli and there was an unlimited amount of resources and food for it, uh, within 72 hours, it would be much bigger than the mass of the earth. Um, thankfully, they run out of resources and this never happens, but uh, they grow very quickly. So in one day, I can go from one cell to millions, if not many, many more cells. And uh, um, so like, like I said, they're very easy to study, very easy to grow, and very cheap to do so. So I wanna talk for a few minutes about solid media. So we saw these, uh, uh, these agar plates in uh, lab one that I used to uh, swab some things around the, um, around the college. So what is agar? Agar comes from this. This is seaweed. So this seaweed has a carbohydrate in there, it gets extracted and, and uh, it, it basically, uh, when you buy it, it's kind of this powdered form, which is, uh, can't maybe tell from this image so much, it has a little bit of a yellowish tinge to it. And uh, basically it's kind of like making jello. You add it to some liquid, you heat it up and boil it, it liquefies, you pour it into your dish, and then uh, it solidifies at room temperature. So it's really, really handy because uh, this way we can look at colonies on a, on a petri dish. So I um, thought I'd show you this here. This was uh, done a couple of years ago by Google. Um, so Julius Petri was the inventor of the Petri dish and Google did one of their little things where they're like, hey, let's celebrate Julius Petri. So I'll play this for you. So you'll notice that they are doing basically the same thing I did for lab one, is going around and swabbing a few different things. So here it goes. You can see they're swabbing these different plates. And look what they did. It's Google, so they had to do their corporate logo. So they spelled Google. You can see what they swabbed. An old sock. Looks like um, a doorknob or keyboard, a dog's mouth, a plant, and the dish sponge. Anyway, cute little um, Google Doodle for you. So um, you may have noticed from uh, Lab One that these things, they grow and they come in many shapes and sizes. Here's, um, here's a really nice picture this person came up with. Uh, it looks like at least about 12 different species. Um, you know, and these colonies, uh, we're gonna get a chance to describe them a little better in Lab Four. Uh, but you can see obviously they come in different colors, but also different shapes. So some shapes are kind of really well-defined. Others are kind of a little, uh, you know, more blobby. The term for that is pleomorphic. Uh, some of them uh, have, uh, you know, little textures to them, some are flat or round, you know, so there's lots of ways you can describe these things. Here are some of the descriptors we're going to use in the lab uh, for lab four, uh, looking at some, some of these colonies, and uh, sometimes that helps you identify what you're looking at. I'll show you an example here. Uh, two of the organisms that we are going to look at are E. coli and Bacillus subtilis, and uh, you can see uh, just looking at the colonies, it's usually pretty easy to uh, know what you have, or at least suspect what you have. You don't always know necessarily until you look at a microscope, but uh, E. coli is pretty typical. It's sort of this creamy color. Um, they're sort of round and shiny, whereas the bacillus is kind of flatter. The, the edge is, is less defined, and, uh, and they're not so shiny. By the way, there's lots of interesting colonies out there. Here's some that I found on the internet. And I'm not sure what these organisms are. I just uh, typed in interesting colonies and uh, this is what I came up with and thought I would share them with you. So by the way, we had already talked about Staphylococcus, the two different species. We had Staphylococcus epidermidus, this is found on your skin. And we have Staphylococcus aureus, which can also grow on your skin. 
And of course, we can't name them both epidermidis. So the second one was named aureus, which is after the atomic uh, symbol for gold, which is AU, and uh, because it has a nice uh, yellowish color to it. So like I said, sometimes you can uh, have an idea of what you have just by looking at it, uh, if you're lucky. Uh, sometimes you can do fun things too. Uh, there's an entire website, by the way, uh, devoted to uh, microbial art where people are making interesting things on petri dishes. So I thought I'd share a couple with you there. So what else is solid media good for? Solid media is good for streaking. So um, word to the wise. Here is some wisdom for you to impart um, if you learn nothing in this class. Uh, and this has nothing to do with biology, um, but um, just some good advice. When you are looking for an image on Google and uh, you know, think carefully about what you're typing into that search bar, right? If you, if you put streaking, um, you, you may get the Super Bowl. Uh, so make sure in this case here, you gotta type in microbial streaking and, and you're not gonna get the Super Bowl or, or some other, um, let's say, interesting events or activities. Um, yeah, so here's some streaking, but this is not the type of streaking I wanna talk about. I wanna talk about microbial streaking and I'm gonna demonstrate this in lab four. I'll give you a quick kind of overview of what is going on here. So the whole idea of this streaking is uh, you might have a bacterial culture and it's really, really concentrated. So you try to grow it on a petri dish and you just end up with, with growth everywhere. So what we want to do is we want to try to figure out a way to deposit a single bacterium into a place on a petri dish and it will double and double and double again and eventually form a colony. And that colony should be all genetically identical cells of one species. So that's the whole idea. So how does this work? Basically, you streak some culture on a plate, and uh, there's an instrument we're going to use to do that. And then what you do is you sterilize that instrument, and then you do it again into a new part of the plate. So the whole idea here is you're dragging some from section one into section two, and uh, hopefully um, you're bringing less this time. And then if there's more room on the plate, you can do it again and again, and hopefully by the end you've diluted that original sample so that you end up with a nice streaked plate. So you can see there's a sample plate there and uh, these uh, colonies here that are, are over here on the, on the left, um, hopefully are gonna be originated from um, a, a one individual uh, bacteria and will be all of the same uh, species and be genetically identical. So this is really important sometimes, it's very often people have mixed colonies by the way uh, from environmental samples and uh, so, you know, you want to identify what's in that and it's, it's important to separate things out or else they're just going to look like a bunch of cream colored blobs that are all mashed together. So let's talk a little bit about um, other types of uh, cells. Uh, I've been talking mostly about bacterial cells up into this point. So I want to talk a little bit about culturing uh, animal cells. So it turns out animal cells uh, are much, much more difficult and way more expensive to culture. So we don't do that here. Um, why are they more difficult to culture? Well, first of all, they, uh, you can't just feed them soup. Um, animal cells are very specific. All of our cells are relying on, uh, in some case, hundreds of different signals from the body. And some of those signals are, are certain vitamins and growth factors. And um, you can imagine you, got, you have so many different types of tissues, right? Some of our tissues kind of grow continuously, like our skin cells. They kind of just continue, they multiply continuously at a certain rate and uh, to replace uh, lost skin, right? Uh, other parts of your body, uh, the liver, only grows when it's damaged, right? So you, you don't want the liver just to keep on growing and then you're gonna, you're gonna explode. Um, so it relies on signals and, and, and very complex nutrients. So sometimes this is actually, it, it'll take people years to figure out uh, how to grow a certain type of cell. I used to work with a woman who grew um, cartilage cells and it took her five to six years to figure out how to do that. And that was a, actually a major uh, achievement for people who were um, studying that kind of uh, tissue. And uh, so it's not trivial. Um, they often require specially coated surfaces. So uh, that's what that special little square plate is like. Uh, so animal cells in particular, uh, most of our cells are attached to something. So our ligaments are attached to bone, our muscles are attached to ligaments and all that. And so, so cells, uh, when they're not attached, they don't grow. Uh, and, and so you gotta coat these things with collagen and, and, and whatnot, which makes them a lot more expensive. So think about it for a second, if your cells 
just grew randomly. That's cancer. So that's why our cells are very well regulated, so this doesn't happen. So like I said, there's lots of techniques. Most of them are quite expensive. Um, another thing, they, they only divide a specific number of times. A lot of our cells will, will grow 25, 50 times, and then they, and that's it. And that's the end of them, they die. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about why that is so when we talk about DNA replication. Um, some don't divide at all. Your neurons, once they've matured and differentiated, they don't usually grow. They might, uh, or they don't usually divide. Uh, so, you know, and, and, and one more reason why animal cells aren't done in a lot of places uh, is they're very slow. So rather than having an overnight culture, it could be a six-week culture. And uh, so for doing certain types of things, we don't want to have to wait six weeks. So most undergraduate labs were, were using bacteria for that reason. Much cheaper, much easier, and less complicated. Um, one huge breakthrough in, um, in culturing uh, animal cells uh, came through in the 1950s. And uh, this was the discovery of HeLa cells. And uh, this is a worthwhile story, by the way. If you're interested in this story, uh, I encourage you to check this book out. Uh, really good, good human story. Uh, so this is 1950s and people were trying to figure out how to culture human cells. And um, this, uh, this unfortunate woman here had uh, cervical cancer and her doctor um, took a biopsy and, uh, and took another look at the cells and it turns out they grew really well. And uh, this was solving a lot of problems. So he, he gave them to a friend of his who was a cell biologist and, uh, and they were able to grow these cells. And uh, he, uh, he used the code that was on the doctor's biopsy sample. So, you know, the first two letters of her first name and the first two letters of her last name, HeLa. Um, and um, and they were, were known as HeLa cells. And uh, this has led to thousands of scientific discoveries. So we're talking about 1950s uh, polio vaccine. We're talking about understanding how uh, DNA replicates in uh, mammalian cells. We're talking about uh, many, 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 many functions about human cells and discovering these HeLa cells. Now, the unfortunate part of this story is, uh, you know, nowadays when you take a biopsy from a patient, you know, there, um, we have very strict confidentiality laws, right? Um, in those days, people were so excited, they, they, they wanted to know where these cells came from, and the doctor gave away the name of the poor woman. And at that point, she had died. And uh, so they started to interview her family, and uh, you know, it, it was very confusing. Her family was very poor. We're talking about dirt, dirt poor, these people, and not understanding why all these scientists were using their mom's cells and all these kind of things. And it's a very interesting, uh, like I said, human interest story. Uh, and uh, I think they even did a, uh, I think Oprah even did a movie on, on it as well uh, on HBO. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, maybe worth it to check out. But very good book. If you're looking for some good science and human story, I encourage you to check out this book. But my point is, this is one way to grow animal cells, is you can make them cancerous. Cancer cells grow very well with nutrients. And uh, so this is a technique that's been used for a long time now uh, to study uh, human and, and, and mammalian cells. So what about viruses? How do we grow these things? Uh, first of all, why? Why would we want to do it? Probably you know the big one now is, of course, vaccine production. Uh, we're trying to make vaccines. You need the viruses or the virus particles. And obviously to study these things, we need to grow them. So how do we grow viruses? Um, you can't give them food. They don't eat food. So what do they do? They live inside cells. So you have to give them cells. And that's how you culture them. So if you have a mouse virus, you may need mouse cells or you may need mice and so on. So I'll, go, I'll show you some examples of how we culture viruses. So if you want to culture bacteriophage, so remember bacteriophage are viruses that infect bacteria such as E. coli. Uh, you grow them on a plate of E. coli or whatever bacteria you're looking at. So this plate here, uh, you can see what they've done is they, uh, the person has spread uh, E. coli or some organism over the entire plate and you get what's called a bacterial lawn. And where the viruses grow, you get these things called plaque, plaques, because the plaques, are, uh, the plaques are actually killing the cells and leaving kind of a clearing there. And so if you stick your little pipetter into the plaque, it's going to be loaded with viruses. So that's one way to do it. And you can do this kind of thing with uh, mammalian cells. 
uh, if you can grow them, that is. Um, another common way to grow animaviruses is in uh, eggs. So we're talking about fertilized embryonated eggs. So these are chicken eggs usually. And you can see um, through uh, various modifications, we can actually grow quite a number of different types of human viruses in embryonated eggs. And uh, this is done for vaccine production. So um, mostly nowadays, this is done for the, uh, the flu vaccine. And uh, this is why if you get the flu vaccine, they might ask if you're allergic to eggs. I think allergic reactions are really, really rare is my understanding, but uh, still it's a, probably a safe precaution. Some people have uh, death, uh, deathly aller are deathly allergic to, to eggs. So probably a safe precaution. Uh, here's somebody who is making um, immortal uh, animal cells, like I said, kind of making them cancerous. And, and then this is what you can grow your, um, your virus in. Okay, so a few other things for today. Um, one thing that uh, I'll talk a little bit about in, um, I think, lab four is something called aseptic technique or sterile technique. Uh, when we're working in a lab, uh, it's kind of important to keep everything clean, but in many cases, a lot of things have to be perfectly sterile. And uh, there's very good reason for this, right? If I am working with something infectious, uh, I don't want to be working with staphylococcus in the lab and then go home with a staphylococcus infection, right? Or I don't want to spread it onto my lunch bag or whatever. So number one is to protect yourself from the chemicals or the bacteria or whatever. And number two is to protect your experiment. So, uh, you know, we have bacteria on our skin and I don't want to have my uh, experiment be infected either, right? So you can see in this case here, uh, this guy is working in something called a biological safety cabinet. And uh, so the air is getting sucked out and filtered. And uh, you can see uh, this guy is wearing a well, you know, mask and gloves. And not all those things are always necessary, but uh, I will demonstrate some techniques uh, for us when we get to lab four about how, uh, some ways to handle uh, bacteria. So one of the last things I want to talk about today is something called cell fractionation. Um, so this is a technique um, that uh, uh, we don't do in the Biology 107 lab because it, it just takes too long. It's not something that can be done in like a three hour lab period uh, very easily. Um, but it's a commonly used technique for uh, isolating parts from a cell. And uh, so the whole idea is we want to get out, um, you know, we want to get the organelles out so we can look at them one at a time. And so this is a pretty commonly used technique in some cell biology labs. So you can see what the first step is, we break apart the cells. So how do we do that? You can do this mechanically using something like a blender. Uh, there are methods that use these things called sonicators that use high frequency sounds to break things open. Uh, sometimes people use uh, certain types of detergents or enzymes that, uh, that break down cell walls or membranes and things like that. So there's quite a few different types of techniques. Uh, that, that can be done. And then you're going to get this homogenate here, which is going to have, you can see there's nuclei and looks like some uh, different membranes and the mitochondria and ribosomes and so on. So the next part of the step to separate out those organelles is something called centrifugation. And uh, so you probably know what a centrifuge is. Um, you've probably seen one maybe in high school. Sometimes they have, uh, they have kind of a um, some cheaper ones. Um, most people don't have these fancy ones that are called swinging bucket centrifuges. So you can see what happens is the test tubes um, are spun at 180 degrees from one another. And some of these uh, centrifuges can uh, go up to many thousand times a minute, at revolutions per minute. And you can get a g-force of something like 100,000 times the gravity constant. So here's kind of how it works. So you can centrifuge at low speeds and you can get pretty heavy things out. So a thousand times G, uh, and uh, you can get uh, uh, any unbroken cells and sometimes large nuclei will pellet out there. And so you can do that with kind of a cheap uh, high school type of uh, centrifuge. And then what you have here is you've got the liquid and the liquid is gonna have smaller things. That's called the supernatant and then you have the pellet. So you can separate those things out. Uh, you can spin at a higher speed. So we have uh, one of these high speed centrifuges that can spin um, up to 20,000 G, and uh, you're gonna start to get um, smaller things, so mitochondria, peroxisomes, and chloroplasts can spin out at that, and you can see 20 minutes, 
Um, this is short, by the way. I've actually done this kind of procedure years ago, and uh, there, I don't remember any one single part in the procedure that was like 10 or 20 minutes. Uh, the procedure I was doing, you were spinning for six to, to 16 hours uh, at different stages. So I'm not sure what's, what uh, this is all about, but this is from the textbook. Probably depends on the cell type that you're looking at. 80,000 G, we don't have one of these here at the, uh, at the college, uh, but you're getting uh, pieces of membrane. And that's actually what I was trying to do. I was trying to isolate uh, different parts of the membrane uh, for some of my research. And like I said, the spins were 12, 16 hours. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a crazy procedure. And uh, you had to be very careful with those tubes that you didn't uh, mix them afterwards as well, of course. And then you can even get out ribosomes by spinning at 150,000 G. This is, this is crazy, by the way. These centrifuges um, that go this fast are, are pretty expensive. And, um, and uh, they, they used to be quite dangerous um, in that, uh, you know, if something was not balanced, uh, you could, you could break, uh, break your sample through a wall. But uh, most of them have really good safety features in them now. Okay, so where are we? That is actually the end of topic uh, three, I guess. Uh, and I see it's 446, so there's no real point in me starting topic four. Topic four is on membranes and cell walls and other cell surface features. So we will pick up there on Friday. So have a great day and we will see you then.